I have to imagine if we node locked a little bit better on the river, if Helmuth, I'm sorry, if Negranu bets and Helmuth raises, Negranu should probably fold almost everything. Most people don't fold almost everything here, but one thing Negranu actually did do very well is he just did not pay off Phil Helmuth on the turn of the river when Helmuth wanted to put in a lot of money. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Lilla for PokerCoaching.com, here today with another hand from High Stakes Duel 2, featuring Phil Helmuth and Daniel Negranu. They were battling it out to see who the greatest poker player in the world is, and um, I'm going to spoil it for you. If you haven't seen it yet, pause the video, I'm about to spoil it. Phil Helmuth won. He made an epic comeback. He got down to 1 20th of the chips in play. That's not a whole lot, and he ended up coming back and winning. They're going to be looking at a pretty cool hand where Helmuth almost certainly goes far off from the GTO strategy and he limps with the 9-6 suited preflop. Now, I want to make it perfectly clear. There is nothing wrong with limping with the 9-6 suited preflop from a GTO point of view. Here is a 15 big blind preflop, I'm sorry, 50 big blind preflop chart. Notice the players are playing 50 or so big blinds deep. And this strategy here has the hands in red, raising, and light red also raising, two different raise sizes. The hands in green are limping, and the hands in blue are folding. Notice almost no folding preflop. A pretty good amount of limping, mostly with the very weak hands, and these hands kind of in the middle that are suited or kind of connected that flop pretty well, plus a smattering of good hands. And then the hands that are raising are typically the very best hands, right? You have the good big cards, the aces, Plus uh, the low suited hands that are pretty weak, like 9-4 suited, 8-2 suited, etc. Plus some random low card kind of junky hands like king-6 offsuit, king, jack-6 uh, jack offsuit, 7-5 offsuit, etc. We want to focus on this 9-6 suited though. And now notice that this 9-6 suited does limp a pretty large chunk of the time. And when you do limp with 9-6 suited, you are definitely going to call against a raise, which is what happens. Helmuth limps, Negranu raises to three big blinds, Helmuth calls. Now, what I'm going to show you here is probably not the correct chart to begin with, because who knows what Helmuth is actually doing. But this is an adjusted preflop strategy we're going to use to analyze how you should play postflop against someone who uses this strategy. Now, the way you read this here is all the hands in gray are folding, the hands in yellow are limping and then calling a raise. Um, the number one here means that when you limp this hand, you're calling a raise with it 100% of the time. Um, and then as the number gets lower, it means you're either limp re-raising or limp folding. Like, for example, Ace Jack suited, maybe he limp re-raises it a decent amount of the time. He's probably never limp folding it. Um, that said, you may be surprised to know that Helmuth will limp and fold some pretty good hands. He's limped and folded King Jack offsuit. He's limped and folded King 10 offsuit. He's limped and folded 9-8 offsuit. I've watched him make all these plays. And he does some very sporadic stuff. You'll also notice I don't have any like tiny fractions of these very weak hands in this range. Again, you could spend more time trying to really, really nail down these ranges and give him the king seven offsuit 10% of the time or something. You could do that. It's really not going to change the post-flop simulation all that much because now we're talking about adding very, very few combinations to the actual range. But, you know, you could do that if you want. And to be fair, these ranges may not be accurate, right? I mean, maybe he's limping wider than this. Maybe he's tighter than this. From what I could tell when he did limp and face aggression, he was pretty tight. So we're going to start with this. And, you know, if you think this is completely wrong, let me know in the comment section and um, it'll be okay. All right. Flop's going to come. King, queen, 10. This is normally a very good flop for Negranu because he's usually going to be raising with a lot of his best hands plus a smattering of low blocker type hands like king x queen x jack x 10x which actually connect pretty well with this board that said helmet's range to limp and then call is usually going to be a little bit stronger than a typical gto player what i mean by that is if you look at this limping strategy notice this limping strategy that's going to call raises is going to be a lot of these marginal suited hands a lot of this stuff is going to miss the flop and a lot of this stuff is going to be kind of weak like middle pair bad kicker or uh, bottom pair bad kicker, right? But if Helmuth's using this strategy, which I do think is way more accurate, uh, at least in terms of the hands that connect with the high card boards, he's actually going to connect very, very well with this king-queen 10 flop because he has a whole lot of good, strong big cards. So 
that is actually going to force Negranu to do a whole lot of checking because he's against a range that connects much better with King-Queen-10 than he would normally be against a player who was limping and then calling a raise with a much more GTO strategy. So here's the strategy Negranu should use, assuming Helmuth uses this preflop strategy, okay? So we see really a whole lot of checking. Um, the hands that are opting to bet a larger portion of the time are going to be hands like top pairs, middle pairs, over pairs, flush draws, random jack x, right? These are all hands that make perfectly logical sense to bet. But essentially, when you're out of position and you don't have much of a range or a nut advantage, you are going to want to check way more often. That said, Negranu does go for the small bet, and you can't say this is necessarily a mistake by any means because we see here King-9 suited does opt to go for a small bet a large chunk of the time. Perfectly fine, perfectly standard. Um, in Helmuth's shoes, this is a pretty easy spot to raise. Now, if you knew Negranu was going to be betting very, very, essentially like a strong-ish range here with just good made hands and the random Jack X and flush draws, you can't do a whole lot of raising because Negranu's range contains a lot of very strong hands, right? But if you think he's continuation betting too often in this spot, maybe he's continuation betting every hand in his range. If that's the case, then you should definitely be doing a ton of raising. However, this 9-6 suited is almost never going to be a hand you want to raise because you're getting really good odds and you're in position. You do not want to screw this up. A great way to screw up a flush draw when you're in position is to raise a small bet because notice right here we have to put in 1,500 to try to win a total of 9,000. We're getting great odds. So calling is just immediately going to be profitable. If we raise here and get re-raised, now we've taken this hand that has very good equity in position and we've kind of thrown it in the trash or forced ourselves to play a big pot. So this is a scenario where Helmuth really should not raise all that often at all. We see him mainly just raising ace-jack and jack-nine for straights, plus a few jack-x's bluffs, like we see jack-eight raising, jack-six raising, jack-five raising, which makes sense because you do need to have some bluffs in your raising range. But this is a spot where he should be calling a lot. Now, I did not node lock anything post-flop here. Um, if I was to try to perhaps make this simulation even more accurate. It would have taken me more time. But if I wanted to make this more accurate, maybe we say that Helmuth actually folds out like pocket sixes to pocket twos a lot. Because, you know, is he calling this flop bet with pocket sixes? I'm not sure. I mean, he should most of the time because he's just getting, again, he's facing such a small bet, right? But if he's going to be folding in this scenario with those hands, then that will change the simulation a little bit. Is he going to call random ace high? Maybe he just folds immediately. I don't think he should, but he will fold the random ace high some portion of the time, so maybe we could have waited these. Um, always try to figure out exactly what you were trying to solve for and um, you know, try to be as specific as you can. All right, this is a spot where he has a pretty easy call, though, and he does call. Turn is the six. Negranu opts to bet again. All right, this is a very important concept that we should talk about. When you bet the flop infrequently with just your good hands and some draws, you're essentially already polarized, right? And when you're polarized, you have really good hands and draws, which means your equity is usually pretty good against your opponent. And when that is the case, you often want to continue betting on the turn using somewhere between like a medium and a large bet size. However, if you bet with everything on the flop or bet with a very wide range on the flop, your range to get to the turn is super wide, but your opponent's range to call your bet no longer contains a lot of the junk, right? So that's going to make their range stronger. So this is a scenario where if Negranu is betting the flop infrequently, he should definitely keep betting this hand on the turn. But if he's betting very frequently on the flop, then I'm not going to say king nine is a check, but I could definitely see a hand like queen nine being a check. So let's take a look at this scenario. This is going to presume again Negranu bet the flop very infrequently using this strategy here, right? Very infrequent flop bet is going to lead to a very frequent turn bet. But like I said, if you bet more often on the flop, perhaps with everything, that's going to result in him having to do a whole lot more checking on the turn. Um, kind of interesting to see. He's only checking 37% of the time on the turn here. Um, hands that are checking, eh, some queens, right? It's still a whole lot of betting with them. Um, a lot of the tens are checking, which makes sense. Tens are very clear marginal made hands at this point. Then we see a lot of like random flush draws, random air betting, 9-8 um, betting a lot, 9-7, 9-6. So a lot of the bad gut shots are, are bluffing. Notice that the Jack X with no pair is bluffing basically every time, which is pretty cool to see. 
and all the kings are betting. So definitely a spot where Negranu should keep betting a large chunk of the time. Notice king nine is mixing it up with a medium or a small bet size here. And Negranu went for the medium size, which is perfectly fine and standard. All right, kind of like on the flop, Helmut should again continue just calling on the turn. He has a very weak made hand, which does have a little bit of showdown value, but also he has a draw that's getting pretty good odds to call. If he raises and finds himself all in here, it's going to be against very good made hands, which is in bad shape against, or flush draws, most of which are going to have the ace. So definitely not a spot where he wants to be raising and piling the money in. So very, very clear call in my mind. And we see 9-6 suited does indeed call the vast majority of the time. Um, again, because Negranu is so polarized at this point, or he should be polarized at this point, Helmuth does not get to raise very often at all. Notice here only raising with king-queen and jack-9, right? Kind of interesting to see the bluffs here come from 10-9. I would not expect 10-9 to be doing too many bluffs here, but it does. Uh, but we see like jack-8 raising sometimes, right? That makes more sense to me. Jack-5 suited, sure. That makes some sense. Ace-9 offsuit raising sometimes. The solver picks some sporadic bluffs every once in a while. You got to make sure you're bluffing, otherwise you're just only raising with the nuts. Okay. River is the three of hearts, completing the three flush. Now, what would you do with top pair in this scenario? I know that you can see that Helmuth has the flush, so of course Negranu should just check fold. We're not trying to check fold normally, okay? Top pair is very good heads up. In this scenario, what would you do if you were in Negranu's shoes, out of position, top pair, marginal kicker when the river brings the third heart? I want you to write it in the comment section below. In this scenario, would you check? Would you bet small, like 6,000? Would you bet medium, like 12,000? Or would you bet big, like 19,000? Pause the video and write what you would do in the comment section below. All right, did you do it? I sure hope so. Going through this active learning process is gonna go a long way to helping you improve your poker skills. And if you wanna continue testing your skills, and then proving your skills, make sure you check out my training site, PokerCoaching.com. You can actually get a free trial membership at PokerCoaching.com slash free. So head over there and check that out right now. This is a spot where I think Negranu should almost certainly check. This three of hearts is really, really bad for him because if Helmuth does have a hand like a queen or a 10 at this point, and Negranu makes any bet size, he's probably just going to get Helmuth to fold. So you're not really going to get called by all that many hands if you value bet. Um, that said, if you are going to bet here, you definitely want to bet on the small side. You're going to find that when you're betting hands that are kind of going for thin value, you usually want to be betting that size with mostly marginal made hands like ace-king, king-jack, king-nine, stuff like that, plus a few bluffs, plus a few nut hands. And you're going to want to be using a bigger bet size with stuff like flushes, straights, um, sets, right? Plus a lot of bluffs mixed into that range. I actually discussed this thoroughly in the tournament masterclass at PokerCoaching.com in the river section because, well, that's how you play the river. And you want to make sure you're not screwing up the river because this is where a lot of money is won or lost. In this scenario, Negranu did decide to bet 6000 And... I think this is probably the second best play. I think you should be checking in this spot, but he does go for the small bet. He actually said after this hand, he didn't even realize the third heart came on the river. This was a long session. This was, I don't know, four or five hours into the game. And, uh, you know, you get tired from battling heads up. I completely get it. That said, Phil Helmus was sitting there sipping on brain fuel most of the day. And that kept him thinking throughout the entire session. I'm part of brain fuel along with Phil Helmuth. And I can tell you, for me, I used to drink a lot of coffee each day, six, seven, eight cups sometimes. But since I started drinking brain fuel, I have one cup of coffee in the morning, one brain fuel right after that, and I am good to go for like 10 to 12 hours. You can check that out at brainfuel.com and use promo code pokercoaching to get 15% off. Give it a try. Let me know what you think in the comment section about it. Um, so in this scenario, actually, let's look at what Negranu should do first. Should Negranu bet here? Uh, mostly no. Notice King 9 checks, King 8 checks, all the King X checks. If he had two pair, he should be betting. Notice that the small bet size is mostly used with aces, kings, king jack for top pair or weaker kicker, queen 10 for a weak two pair, which makes sense, right? It's pretty much what I laid out. Um, notice down here, I have to presume these are some flushes with the ace x using the small bet size, which is cool to see. 
Then we see the bigger bet sizes being used with ace jack for the straight, pocket queens for sets, pocket tens for sets, jack nine for straight, low random flushes that we have, right? So the bigger bet size is mostly going into those. So this is a spot where I think Negranu probably should just check, but uh, you know, it bets small every once in a while. And now Helmuth has to decide what to do here. Lots of decision points in this hand, huh? I think it's a pretty easy raise. The question is how much do we raise? This is a spot where if you think Negranu's range is just really marginal and you think he's pretty much always going to fold the vast majority of that to an all-in, then you should definitely use a small raise size. However, this is a spot where when Negranu bets flop, bets turn, and bets river, he should be very polarized. Either a really good made hand like two pair or better, or I suppose we saw using the small bet size, king, jack, and better, right? Or it should have just nothing. And when your opponent's range should be pretty strong, you typically want to go for the maximum. That lets you bluff with as many hands in a profitable manner as you can, and it just gets you full value from your good hands. Helmuth goes for a small raise, but let's take a look at what the GTO strategy is. It is to go all in, right? Notice here, all of these flushes, well, all these hands on the bottom that are flushes are opting to go all in. Makes a lot of sense. Nut flushes also go all in. Really, no hand raise is small here. And that's just because Negranu's range to get here should be pretty good. And if his range is generally pretty strong, he's going to have to pay you off a large chunk of the time. Kind of interesting to see here that the hands that are going for the bluff are random ace six, queen jack, and queen eight, and jack eight. Normally, you're not seeing a whole lot of hands as good as a queen turning themselves into a bluff. But remember, Negranu's betting range here should be pretty good. So this hand, like queen jack, actually is not great all that often. Um, this is a spot where when you are bluffing, you definitely want to block the flush ideally with whatever the biggest hearts are that are available. And that's why we're seeing hands like the ace six bluffing. I can pretty much guarantee you this is the ace of hearts with a six. This queen jack is almost certainly queen of hearts with a jack uh, either, or perhaps a queen with a jack of hearts. Same thing with this jack eight. Same thing with this queen eight. These are definitely hands with the queen of hearts in them and the jack of hearts in them. So in this scenario, when you are bluffing, and you should be bluffing sometimes, you want to make sure you are using those power hearts. Pretty cool to see that hands even in like uh, king queen are good enough to value shove. Eh, I suppose against the small bet it makes sense, right? If you look at the small betting strategy again, king queen actually does pretty well against the small betting strategy. But I have to imagine if Negranu did use a bigger bet size, then you would probably just call instead. Anyway, back in Negranu's shoes, pretty easy fold with king nine. Got to presume he's going to fold here. Um, two pairs marginal, right? Um, king ten suited calls. King six suited calls. King Jack, is, it looks like that's where you're going to start folding. Aces folds as well, although Ace King does call. I would fold Ace King here every time against Helmuth. <laughs> I'm sure most of the Ace King in this scenario that is calling probably blocks the Ace of Hearts, so it makes it harder for Helmuth to have the nuts. But King Nine here is just a very, very trivially easy fold once you get to this point. I have to imagine if we node locked a little bit better on the river, if Helmuth. I'm sorry, if Negranu bets and Helmuth raises, Negranu should probably fold almost everything. Most people don't fold almost everything here, but one thing Negranu actually did do very well is he just did not pay off Phil Helmuth on the turn of the river when Helmuth wanted to put in a lot of money. And pretty much every time he made a big fold, it was the right fold. So that's going to be it for today. Again, let me know what you think about this video. I realized that it was a little bit in depth. We were using the GTO solver in a way that is not how a lot of people are necessarily accustomed to where we adjust what strategies the opponent uses. That said, you definitely should be adjusting the strategy to the one that your opponent uses because most people don't play like a GTO robot. Who'd have thought? That's me for today. Again, if you like this, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button below. Also click the notification bell. That lets the YouTube algorithm know that I am worthy of your math liking recommendation. Good luck in your games. Have a great day. And I'll talk to you next time.